So we go once more again because I forgot to put on my microphone. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening dear Viola friends all over the world. Welcome to the lecture about the effects of humidity on our beloved violas. The lecture will be presented to you by Roberto Gardon Rico. My name is Karen Dolman and together with Carlos Maria Solare we will, we, will, we will be your host tonight operating from the lowlands of Holland. In Holland, we know everything about the humidity levels that have a profound effect on the quality of our dikes that protect our country. I suppose windmills will not be in Roberta's lecture, but one never knows. Welcome, uh, Carlos. Hi, Karin. Sorry, there went a few things wrong, but I think the people uh, maybe hear me and will hear me now. Will you hear you now? Uh, it's always a bit tricky with all the microphones you have to put in and to put out. So, um, but here we are. Uh, Carlos, welcome. Hi, nice to be with you, Karin. Um, Would you like well, to tell me a bit about yourself and what you do with the International VO Society? Well, uh, I've been involved uh, with the Viola Society for a long time. I've been a member of the German Viola Society where I live for over 40 years now. And I've been a member of the International Viola Society board since 2005, when I was appointed a secretary. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was not long after that, that uh, I, re I received a CD of Spanish viola music played uh, by a player I didn't know about called Luis Muniz. And in the booklet it said that he was a president and founder of a Spanish association of friends of the viola. And I said, how come I don't know about him? <laughs> so uh, there was a, an, an address in the booklet and I wrote to him. So we, we got in touch. And about a year later, I, I traveled to Oviedo in northern Spain, where he's based. Uh, and he organized the first Spanish viola congress. And I, mean, yes. I, was, I was very honored to be a part of that. So I, I, I've been in it from the beginning, so to speak. And, and Roberto, uh, who is going to talk later, was uh, also a participant at, at that congress. And for that reason, it's a very great pleasure to be uh, able to pre introduce them to th this uh, international broadcast tonight, Luis and Roberto. I will put them, I'll get them into the Zoom. Uh, there is, comes Luis first and Roberto. Let's see. Hello. Yes, hello. <laughs> Roberto, hello, Luis. There you are. So, uh, uh, maybe Luis would, would like to tell you, uh, tell us in your words uh, about the beginnings of the internet, of the Spanish Viola Society in, in 2007, I believe, right? Yes, you are right. And you know probably better than me because you were the person who helped us out a lot with the process. Um, yeah, uh, certainly we started in 2007 with, uh, with, uh, with Carlos as, a, as a, the person who, who helped us to, to start with. And we have held uh, during this period of time seven national uh, viola congresses. Carlos attended a couple of them, if I remember well. We have had also a huge amount of uh, master classes, seminars, and workshops also. And uh, we also do a summer academy every mm -hmm. year during the summer to attend uh, students who want to spend uh, a week with us. Uh, also, a very important part of the Spanish Viola Society is the service of publications that we run uh, the last uh, six, seven years. We started to produce some publications to rescue uh, part of the Spanish Viola repertoire. We, we have published uh, two books already uh, about the, the history of Viola in Spain. 
We have published uh, one the documentary, one DVD, with the, with the music, uh, the Spanish music for viola, between the, the two uh, big words that uh, Spain, the, the last two words that Spain suffered, the, the word of, of Cuba against uh, the America and the civil war. In this period of time, there are certain viola compositions that we, we recorded and uh, we published in the documentary. Also, we have published several scores of uh, viola music in this time, and we have had uh, two online competitions for students. Yes, and uh, our aims in the, in the future, we, we have to stop everything during the pandemic in 2020 and 2021, it's in very difficult times, but hopefully for the next year, our aim is to maintain the Summer Academy to continue publishing at least one or two uh, music scores per year and uh, to retake the online competition. Very nice, and very to nice. Hold, probably in the near future uh, to hold the uh, International Viola Congress. But uh, it depends on financial issues that, uh, well, let, let's see what happens. I don't close doors. I try to be optimistic and maybe in the near future we, we could have the possibility of having an international Viola Congress here in Spain. Very nice, very nice, very nice. Very nice. The resume of, of our activities and uh, maybe I don't know if I have to introduce Roberto or you uh, have already done so. Roberto, Roberto. Yes. Tell us a bit about what you what you did for us. Uh, well, uh, it was a sort of an experience in our shop because uh, we had never done anything like this. I, I've uh, given some presentations and talks for more for players than for makers, but uh, but well, uh, it was fun. Uh, it really stopped for, stopped us all for a, for a while in our shop. Jardón Rico, uh, we are three makers full time. Uh, Fernando. Luis Campa and myself, and uh, they helped me a lot, especially Luis, that uh, was able to put everything together. We tried to give as much information as possible, um, to give some sort of uh, rational account of how humidity affects the, the viola, but, uh, well, aimed for musicians, not for makers. Yeah. Uh, I hope it's uh, well. It's easy to digest. I, I hope so. <laughs> I saw already, of course, the film. So uh, and uh, I was very impressed with it. So it's uh, it's a very good film. Um, um, Roberto, uh, um, uh, what's the duration? It's about half an hour, I think. Eh? The the film. Eh? Yes. It, yes. yes. Uh, so yes, twenty eight minutes. Yes. Yeah. So what the people? What you could do if you're do if you have questions. Uh, you can put them in the in the chat of the uh, of the of the live stream, and we will gather the chats the, the questions. And maybe uh, Roberto, we can when we come back after the uh, after the film, you could give maybe some answers on the questions. Sure. So I, I people be active and go for it and take a lot of uh, uh, put a lot a lot of in our in our uh, chat room. Yeah. So. Um, all people um, have a lot of fun by watching the film, and uh, there we go. Okay, have fun. Hello, dear friends of the viola community. Welcome to our shop. My name is Roberto Jardón Rico. I am a violin maker and restorer from Asturias, the city is Aviles, in the north coast of Spain. Today we are going to give a, a small presentation about the effects of humidity changes on the viola. So we are going to talk about different aspects of the influence of humidity on the viola and by extension on other bowed instruments. We will show that wood is a hygroscopic material 
sensitive to moisture, and we will give some practical advice regarding tuning, neck projection, and string clearance. A procedure to identify an optimum humidity range for our instrument and how to keep it controlled and safe will be discussed among other useful topics. To understand why and how humidity has a deep influence in our instruments, in their performance and their integrity, we have to explain what hygroscopic materials are. The viola and the rest of the bowed instruments are made of wood, glue and varnish. The top is commonly made of spruce and the rest, the back, sides, neck and scroll, are usually made of maple. Black parts like the fingerboard and the tailpiece are made of ebony and the interior parts like the ribs and blocks of a spruce or other soft wood like willow. Wood is a hygroscopic material because it absorbs water in the form of vapor from the surrounding air and it also loses it trying to be at exactly the same level as the environment. When we talk about musical instruments, we understand that they are built with seasoned wood that has dried naturally for a number of years. So the cavities of the tracheid cells, that are like longitudinal tiny tubes of rectangular section, are empty of water. When the wood is not dry, the water in the cavities of the cells is known as free water. What concerns us, as the wood in the instruments is dry, is what we call bound water, and it is associated with one of the main substances in the wood. There are three main chemical components of wood, cellulose, lignin and hemicellulose. Cellulose is very stable, not hygroscopic and represents around 50% of the wood. Lignin is also stable and works like a glue that bonds the fibers and represents another 20% of the mass. What really should concern us is the other component, hemicellulose, which represents the other 25%. Hemicellulose is very hygroscopic and retains bound water instead of free water. We find it in the layers of the cell walls and it works like a sponge that gets bigger when it absorbs water. This is the principal mechanism of wood dimensional change. A hygroscopic material expands when it absorbs water from the atmosphere and shrinks when it dehydrates. This is a major problem in the use of wood in musical instruments. Dimensional changes are different in the three axes of a piece of wood. Longitudinally or axially, the percentage of expansion is 0.4%, almost nothing. Radially, the expansion and contraction can reach 4%. Tangential change is double. 8%. Wood density has a role in this story too. Density is proportional to dimensional variation. Spruce for the top is a light kind of wood that averages 38% density, while maple averages 60%, so we can expect the back of the instruments to have a lot more swelling and sinkage than the top. This difference creates distortions and internal tension in areas of the instrument every time it is adjusting to the moisture content of the atmosphere. This kind of variation is always happening unless the instrument is kept in a completely controlled environment, like in a museum. In real life, our instruments experience these changes all the time. There is a seasonal pattern for each territory. For example, in many places of the northern hemisphere, Summer has higher levels of humidity than winter because wet soil and more intense sun radiation produce more evaporation. Some places have small seasonal humidity variations and this is very lucky, while other places have extreme changes, like for example the east coast of USA and Canada, 
very humid summer and very dry winter caused by the cold Labrador current. Indoor and outdoor values are different too. Hot air can contain more water than cold air. Relative humidity is a rather difficult concept. It is the ratio of the real moisture in the air, also called absolute humidity, to the maximum amount of moisture the air can hold at the same temperature. This means that a given absolute humidity represents different values of relative humidity at different temperatures. In cold air, it will have a high value and in the hot air, a lower value. Relative humidity is what really affects our instruments and it is what we need to pay attention to. Let's talk now about how humidity variations make tuning problematic through some periods of the year. Pegs are just conical pieces of wood with a small handle that fit inside conical holes in the peg box. How precisely they fit together determines how well the system works. But it is a very primitive and even problematic system that brings a lot of frustration to musicians. As we explained before, wood being a hygroscopic material absorbs water from the air and releases it trying to reach an equilibrium with the environmental humidity. When the moisture is high, the pegs will swell and the peg box holes will shrink, resulting a big increase in friction. In practice, this means that with high humidity, we will need much more effort to move the pegs. They will often move in leaps, producing an unpleasant tack-tack noise, and tuning will become very difficult as the frequency jumps back and forth, not falling in the right place. In a very extreme scenario, the pegs can get stuck. What happens when the instrument dehydrates? The pegs will shrink while the peg box holes will become larger to a point where the string tension can be bigger than the friction, allowing the string to get loose. When we open our case, and we find one or more loose strings, we should become aware that the instrument is losing water, and this dehydration can be dangerous, even causing cracks. We can't expect this primitive system of tuning to work well all through the year. It's not realistic. If the place where we live has huge humidity differences along the seasons, then we will see that the pegs will behave following this pattern. We will need to intervene and the traditional way is modifying the friction of the pegs. How can we do this? When the friction is too big because of high humidity, we will use a lubricant substance. Traditionally, simple dry soap works fine. We will extract the peg from the peg box and rub a small amount of soap in the shiny bands where it is in contact with the peg box give a few turns without the string to check that it moves fluidly and then put the string back. When the friction is too low, on the other hand, because the instrument is dehydrated, we can increase it by using chalk the same way as the soap. Just a little amount on these shiny areas. Sometimes we will use both soap and chalk in different proportions, always checking how the peg moves. This is the advantage of having two substances with opposite effects. We can either use only one of them or both with different quantities. Commercial products for this purpose are usually mixtures of a lubricant and a mineral substance, but you can't alter the proportion, so it is more limited, especially in extreme situations. Graphite, although it has become popular for this use, is, in our opinion, never advisable. It gives the illusion that it works, but after a short time, we notice that it doesn't. It's too thin for the wood pores. 
Another very noticeable effect of humidity on the instrument is the variation in the neck and fingerboard projection angle. As we said before, musicians often verbalize concern about temperature, hot or cold weather, referring to possible issues with their, with their instruments. But these issues, as we explained, are mostly determined by humidity and not heat. And this is a very clear example with a lot of impact. Let's talk about it. When air moisture is high, the fingerboard will drop sensibly, increasing the distance to the strings and making us work harder to press them against it. If this effect is very big and the strings are too far from the fingerboard, it will affect deeply the way we play, slowing the movement of the fingers and causing unnecessary tension in the wrist also affecting vibrato technique. Some musicians take their violas to the shops at this time to reduce the height of the bridge. But this is not the right time of the year to do it, and we will explain why later. Now, when the instrument is dehydrated, usually in the winter with the added effect of heating, the fingerboard will rise, coming closer to the strings and making our life easier regarding left hand. If this dehydration is too extreme, the fingerboard can approach the strings too much, and this can start to produce residual noises. In cellos, where these movements are greater, in some extreme cases it forces the players to have two bridges to be able to play comfortably through the seasons. This is common, especially on the east coast of the USA and Canada. If we think about it, the fingerboard goes up and down like the pen that draws the curves in the paper cylinder of a museum hygrometer, always following the moisture content. So if we are thinking about reducing the height of the bridge to make the strings softer and easier to press, we should do it in the winter when we know that the fingerboard projection is at its highest point. If we do it in the summer, it can happen that when the fingerboard goes up, the strings might be too close and produce noise, and this would force us to order a new bridge. Of course, we can keep the first one and use it when the humidity is high again and the strings are too far from the fingerboard. This pattern repeats incessantly. These very noticeable movements of the neck and fingerboard projection are produced by the expansion and contraction of the top and the back of the viola, trying to accommodate to humidity levels. And this brings further problems that will impact both playability, as we have seen, and also sound. What can we say about this? Again, the behavior of the instrument follows a pattern and it is completely predictable. For example, when the viola is exposed to a high level of humidity, the distance between the top and the back will increase, making the sound post a little loose. When we play it, we notice that the response is slow, always a little late, and the sound becomes rubbery. The water in the wood increases the weight of the top and the back and also makes the wood softer, so, so the instrument loses some of its brightness some proportion of high harmonics. It can actually get really dull if the moisture is very high. The other extreme situation is that of high dehydration. The top and the back come closer to each other, making the sound post tighter. Less water also means less weight and the wood is also stiffer, so the response of the instrument is faster but unforgiving. We need to pay more attention to the bow because we can easily produce residual noises in the attack. We can't play comfortably so close to the bridge. 
Usually, the sound output is bigger, but to some extent this depends on how the instrument is built. Some violas will only work well in either high or low humidity environments, and will suffer in the others. There will always be an optimal level regarding sound and performance. It is of great importance to the players to be conscious of the regime changes in the behavior of their instruments. We find that often they blame themselves or feel that they are not at their best when these are objective problems of the instruments that have always happened and that follow a very clear pattern that will repeat again and again. This makes monitoring humidity levels a very profitable practice for the viola players as they start becoming aware of how the instrument works through the year and what to expect from it in each period. As we said before, the sound performance of an instrument is deeply influenced by the humidity level of the surrounding air and this makes us think that for each instrument there will be an optimal range of moisture content in which it will offer best results. We all perceive that there are periods when the instrument is more responsive and more pleasant to play. We need to be able to identify this range and for this purpose we use a hygrometer, a device that measures relative humidity in the air. They are easy to find and cheap Sometimes the cases have analogic hygrometers that get, give fairly reliable measurements, but not good absolute values. For example, if we see that the hand indicates a drop from 70% to 50%, we can trust that the relative humidity has gone down 20%, but we can't be so sure about the 70 and the 50 figures. They usually need to be set, moving the hand to maximum humidity when we saturate the device with moisture. Digital hygrometers are probably the best choice. If we put a number of them together and compare their readings, we will see that there are discrepancies, but not so big. For our purpose of identifying when our instrument sounds best and when it might be at risk, they are okay. We should take a digital hygrometer to the room where we study and start monitoring humidity and trying to correlate it to our subjective impression of how the instrument works. We can even take down notes on a calendar, following the curve imposed by the seasons. Soon we will experience that when the humidity drops from a certain point, the instrument will start to sound harsh, to be sort of irritable, and as we explained before. On the other hand, when the humidity goes up, there will be a level from which the viola starts to sound dull, slow, irresponsive. All instruments are slightly different and have different allowance for moisture and dryness. It is common to see that a viola works best from 45 to 55%, and out of this range, the performance gets worse the more we depart from it. Another viola can have this range from 35% to 45% or from 50 to 60, but we need to identify our target range. When we have finally found it, we will always be conscious of what is going on with the instrument and what we can expect from it regarding humidity. This knowledge can help us in other ways. It can be useful to find the best rooms in the house to keep the instrument as storage is also important. It can help us to identify potentially dangerous places for the integrity of the instrument. Apart from natural humidity variations due to weather changes and the seasons, it is very important to be aware of the influence of the artificial environments such as heating and air conditioning. In winter, the cold air, as we said earlier, cannot hold so much moisture. Below zero Celsius, the water vapor is very low, giving a relative humidity of around 17%. This is almost like desert. Inside the houses, we use heating devices that also dry the air. This becomes an extreme environment that is very dangerous. Often, old cracks open 
and new cracks appear on the tables of the instruments. Buildings with central heating are especially dry environments, very dangerous because even if we choose to turn it off in our flat, the rest of the neighbors will use it and the whole building will be very dry. It is a paradox, but auditoriums are also dangerous places. Heating will be strong in the winter and in the summer air conditioning, which is a strong source of dehydration as the procedure to lower the temperature implies getting rid of water. A huge closed and insulated space like an auditorium with heating and air conditioning systems is very difficult to keep with good moisture levels. Once we know how to monitor moisture content and correlate it with the behavior of the instrument, we can also prevent scenarios of extreme levels that can put in danger the integrity of the viola. A device that will help us do this is the humidifier, commonly called damp it. The concept is very simple, a rubber tube with small holes that contains a very hygroscopic tissue, similar to the floor mob fibers. When do we use it? Only when we expect a rapid dehydration, for example, when we travel from a humid place to a dry place. The idea is that the instrument, as we know, will always tend to accommodate to the surrounding level, and if it dehydrates fast, it will shrink. If it shrinks too much, new cracks can occur, or old cracks can open. Dehydration is faster than moisturizing, so the humidifier can help to make dehydration slower, not to prevent it completely. If we plan to stay for a long time in a dry place, we can use the humidifier at the beginning of the trip and use it for a few days until the instrument gets used to the new drier level. Given enough time, the dimensional changes will happen without risk. Only rapid shrinkage can cause real damage. Long airplane flights are dangerous too because the air in the cabin has to be dehydrated to be pressurized. What is the right procedure to use the damp it or humidifier? We just need to immerse it in water, then take it out, twist it to remove excess and dry the surface with a paper tissue. Then we introduce it inside the instrument through the, the lower orifice of the left sound hole. Be careful when you extract it, pulling gently and occasionally rotating the tube so that it doesn't damage the lower ring of the sound hole. We have to check periodically the content of water in the humidifier and to do so we press it with our fingers looking for evidence of water inside the small holes. If we forget to renovate the water in the period that we intend to use the humidifier, it will do nothing. We also need to know that the humidifier does not remove water from the instrument when it is dry. It wouldn't work like that in a damp environment. It is just a humidifier as long as we keep it wet, not a dehumidifier. The internal humidifier can eliminate the risk of rapid dehydration and the occurrence of cracks, but eventually the viola needs to be in equilibrium on its own in any climate. Regarding storage, the hygrometer gives us valuable information about which rooms in the house are more appropriate to keep the instrument, even if we study in a different room. In wet places, the south rooms are drier. If our house is very dry, then maybe the north rooms are better. It all depends on the optimal range that we have been able to establish for our viola previously. How much can we trust cases as humidity insulated containers? Not very much really. They are not hermetical. So after three quarters of an hour to an hour, the humidity level inside the case will be the same as outside. If we travel from a dry place to a humid one, the instrument is not at risk unless it is extremely humid. However, the risk is much smaller. Maybe glue joints come apart but no cracks. 
the biggest danger is dehydration in a very short period of time. A common place where cracks appear on the top when it shrinks rapidly is on both ends of the lower saddle. How does this happen? The top contracts a lot becoming narrower, but the saddle doesn't because ebony is more stable and because its fibers are longitudinal to its length and it doesn't allow the top to contract more. As the top shrinks and gets narrower, the saddle produces the cracks. Very high humidity levels affect the glue joints. The reason is that the glue that violin makers use is mainly collagen, which is again a very hygroscopic material. The most common type is hide glue, but also bone and fish glue are in use. Hide glue is an animal glue extracted from hide tissue. It is presented in granules or flakes that are first mixed with water and then heated in a double boiler up to a temperature of around 60 degrees Celsius where it reaches the maximum strength. Why is collagen glue important to bow musicians? The answer is simple. It is a reversible glue. Surfaces glued with this kind of adhesive can come apart when needed without breaking the wood. So in a way, all the instruments wouldn't have survived so long if they had been assembled with a different kind of glue. Heat and moisture release height glue molecules and allow us to open joints. It is also a very strong glue. If we think about the tiny surface of the central joint of a top, it is amazing that this glue keeps both sides bond together for even centuries in a solid way. The same about the joints of the sides and ribs with the top or back. But what is indeed a virtue, at the same time becomes a weakness. Every now and again, joints are loosened. Where does this happen? Mainly at the same places, following a pattern well known by restorers, in the upper right shoulder and in the left lower bout, close to the chin wrist, the areas where the surface of the viola is in contact with your hand and neck. In this case, it is the humidity and warmth of our skin and sweat that weaken the joint, mostly during humid and hot times of the year. If the air moisture is very high, the fingerboard, the neck or other glue joints may open too. Although it seems scary, it is not as dangerous as cracks and it is the price we have to pay to take advantage of using this amazing glue. That would be all for now. Thanks for your attention and I hope you found this useful to preserve and enjoy this amazing instrument. So, that was really wonderful, uh, Roberto. You did a really well, very good job you did. Can everybody good. hear me? Yes, yes, we are here. Yeah, very good. Okay. Um, uh, I found a few questions. Did you see them as well in the chat of the, of the YouTube channel? Um, uh, I will put them. Uh, the Jutta Puchhammer, uh, she came, she's from Canada. And she asked uh, what to do if your instrument gets too drunk to resonate, like in a very humid summer, uh, summer after two, three week period in a very humid place. And Jutta asks as well suggestions uh, when you travel very often between summer and winter from dry humid to uh, south to North uh, America. Or from dry, humid summer, European to Canada. So, with the traveling, why, what could she uh, do some more, uh, Roberto? Uh, well, um, when the humidity is high, there's not so much we can do. 
um, if our home is, uh, I don't know, equipped with uh, uh, the humidifier, the humidifier, and a humidifier that are um, have a feedback system mm -hmm. that uh, some, something similar to what uh, some shops have. Uh, uh, well, in that case, uh, we can control it, but uh, we cannot do so much when humidity is high. Mm -hmm. What, what uh, we have to uh, pay attention really is uh, all the situations in which this very high humidity will drop suddenly. But we cannot fight high humidity, really. No, 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 we can't. Technology. No, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of life, I think, uh, for, for a lot of people who travel a lot. Um, and then Mimi, Mimi is from Chile, Chile, so that's very nice. Um, um, and uh, Jutta comes back again, uh, but we will, I will ask her later on. Um, uh, Mimi, she's from Chile, and Mimi asked, what do you think about playing in a park or similar? Is it too much dangerous for your instrument, or would it better to using a secondary instrument? Uh, well... Uh, if it's a historical instrument or if it's a delicate instrument, uh, yes, uh, it's uh, too risky because both the, the direct sun is very dangerous, but also the, the if if there's this kind of um, of fog or very light uh, rain. I do, uh, well, he, here in Asturias we call it orbayo. It's yeah. uh, it's a mixture of fog and rain. Yeah. And, and, uh, you never know when that that's going to happen and uh, i've seen instruments that uh, that have suffered especially the varnish and no i, I don't recommend to play in open air with uh, a valuable instrument yes it's, it's risky <laughs> yeah okay uh, so then the, the second instrument uh, then it's maybe maybe good to take um uh, Depends on everything, of course, and you should ask then uh, your organizers uh, what they will do on it, eh? um, which is uh, very thing what's very good. Um, and then Yuta came back. Uh, we talk about summer camps. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, um, so, and Christopher uh, Skauch comes. I've played uh, a violin viola for 45 years, and most of this was completely new information for me. So, thank you, he says. So, there are a lot of uh, thank you. Dorothea from Italy says a wonderful presentation as well. So, that's very nice. Um, 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 maybe I have one question for you. Um, <laughs> it won't be a difficult question, <laughs> I promise you. No, um, I think um, as well, but I, I'm, I'm curious how you think about it, is uh, about the, the, the differences between new in built instruments and very old instruments. Uh, well... Um there should be some difference that is related to the amount of, the amount of hemicellulose because hemicellulose, which is the really um, the substance that creates all this trouble, uh, hemicellulose thing, uh, um, tends to uh, disappear along the time. But uh, the percentage is uh, like two percent uh, in a century. It's very low. All the instruments, if they don't have cracks, they are not so sensitive to humidity. But it's a subtle difference. It's not a lot. On the other side, new instruments, especially in the first year when they are made, they have to suffer a lot of compression that changes the shape of the archings. And that is increased by humidity. So instruments, in a way, suffer, they change a lot, they give a strange behavior, but uh, um, if we uh, submit them to humidity cycles, they mature earlier. But, uh, but the, the player suffers a lot, because uh, <laughs> every day the sound is different. Yes, yes. It is, I know. And then after a few years you have to adjust the new sound post, uh, because it, it it moved already so much. It's like a, a newborn baby. You have to buy new clothes for it. But then yeah. when it grows out, it's okay, I think. <laughs> Till it gets old again. <laughs> and Jutta comes as well. Um, has a atmospheric pressure an influence on our instruments? 
um, I don't think it, it really is, comp we cannot compare the influence of humidity, which is really, really deep to, to atmospheric pressure. Yeah. I, I don't think, we, we shouldn't worry about it, I think. <laughs> and uh, what about flying planes? What do you do uh, to our, what do that do, that do to our instruments? Well, that's a, a big source of dehydration. Yes, that, that's something we have to, to care about, especially long flights. Um, um, we never should uh, risk the instrument uh, being taken to one of the cabins that uh, is not pressurized. That's very tricky. We, we see that uh, a lot in the shop that some, some staff in the, in the flight company suggests putting the instrument in one of these cabins that's really, really dangerous because um, the air can be at maybe 40 degrees yes. uh, under Celsius. Yes. So the humidity is, is almost inexistent. That's very dangerous. Yeah, this in is the normal cabin where we fly, uh, that's also a very dry environment. But uh, with the humidifier, we, ca we can take care of that just mm -hmm. with the humidifier. It should be enough. Only if it's a very long uh, flight. If it's just a couple of hours, it shouldn't uh, be a big problem. But uh, a flight uh, that crosses the Atlantic, well, we should think about it, I think. <laughs> and maybe uh, suggest that maybe uh, uh, musicians should, be, uh, should know more about their instrument and what they had have, could do to fix it themselves. Like maybe take the glue with them <laughs> ah, well, <I> don't know. <laughs> on a tour. <laughs> And a butter knife <laughs> and some clogs. Now, I think uh, people. Uh, I think musicians who really travel a lot should be able to just glue their their instrument a bit. But uh, that well, maybe yes. <laughs> I um, I wouldn't want to be. I wouldn't uh, want to feel responsible of that advice. Uh, no, I know, I know. <laughs> it's a tricky thing. It's, you it have to is. take the the boiler. You have to know a lot about uh, the glue and uh, the viscosity of the glue and yeah. how it runs because it's a very uh, it's a difficult stuff to work with. Yeah. So and never. So yeah. And yeah, of course, you have to know how to do it because otherwise you get uh, people who just take a wood uh, glue and then <laughs> put the instrument together. No, that wouldn't be a good idea. No. <laughs> so and um, of course you have the instrument, but you have as well the hair of your uh, of your bow. Huh? You talked about it as well. And um, so if the, the, the air gets really dry and you see that your bow even can't lose anymore, what should you do with your bow? And your bow is about 10, 12, 13,000 euros. What do you do with your bow? Well, um, there's nothing you can do again, because um, the keratin that is the, 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 the main molecule of the hair is and then after extremely sensitive to humidity, very, very sensitive to humidity. We notice this when we have a shower, we see that our hair gets uh, um, like very plas plastic. Uh, it even We can even stretch it a lot more before it breaks. And that happens to the bow hair. Uh, I don't know, because uh, what can you do? Maybe uh, put for a minute the, the bow inside the bathroom when when the when the when the, the water in the shower is is running yeah. or or maybe you take out a screw and just leave it like that in your in your in your uh, suitcase till you come in a better environment or something the bow shouldn't suffer so much uh, being a little tense because when we play uh, the memory of the of the structure of the wood remains but uh, to keep it uh, so tense for a long time, that's also tricky. Yeah. I think we should try to rehair it as soon as possible. Yes. Um, yeah, but when it's just when it's very dry, like in Canada, Utah, uh, uh, then it's maybe maybe sometimes you have to say, okay, uh, I don't use the bow now. Uh, just put uh, the hair loose and save your bow and take a cheaper bow for that moment. <laughs> yes, if it's very extreme, yes, that would yes. be the, the most reasonable thing to do. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, and the other way around, it doesn't hurt a bow. When it's too long, the hair, you can't play, but uh, it doesn't hurt a bow. <laughs> yes, yes, no risk for the bow, but uh, the behavior is uh, 
a lot worse. Yeah, worse you uh, you only will play Colegno then, but that's okay as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it sounds very good on a viola. <laughs> okay, very <laughs> nice, very nice. Uh, Carlos, would you like to add as well something in this whole discussion we have? <laughs> well, I, I, I've learned a lot <laughs> and remembered uh, things that I'm supposed to know, but sort of uh, you never think about it until uh, it's maybe too late. I, I was reminded of when we had a viola congress in, in Arizona, in, in, in the middle of the desert. That was an extreme case for my viola. Ah. So I think that, that, that was the, the only time I uh, actually, it, 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 it didn't get any cracks, but the, 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 it, it opened, so the, the, the glue opened. Yeah. It was quite extreme. Yeah. So but I, I didn't try to repair it myself. I, I remember playing, uh, playing in Costa Rica as well. Um, in in this very uh, wet uh, situation, and I had to play with my bow, and then I put my thumb under it so I could give a bit more pressure, and then went on with the death of the, the maiden's death. So uh, that's uh, the Schubert, <laughs> which was very that's funny to play like that. <laughs> that's the old French technique. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> French Baroque technique. Yeah. Um, 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 Luis, would you like yes. to tell something more, or? Well, the only thing I I would say is to thank Roberto and his team for the wonderful job they have made. Yes, it was a tremendous effort for them, and I always ask him if uh, he need any help. And he refuses. So he <laughs> makes everything by himself, and he's with the with the help of of uh, his assistant Luis. So congratulations! It was uh, just spectacular. Thank you. Yeah, very nice. And I see uh, uh, in the chat as well a lot of people who really are uh, really really are glad with everything and how it works. So um, I have somebody more in the waiting room. And that's um, uh, for the broadcast of next month. Maybe you are curious as well, which country will go there. Um, it's very near to my country, I must say. I have the tulips already on the table because it's Holland. And I have, in the, I have to go to the Zoom, everything to the same time. Um, let's see if I can have... In, uh, in this um, meeting, I have Emlyn Stam. He is our, um, our our treasurer of the Dutch Viola Society for a very long time, and he was the uh, big uh, big um, money getting uh, behind our congress in 2018. So we are very uh, thank thankful for him. So I will invite him as well with us in the Zoom. Hi, Hello. Emlyn. Good evening, and, congratu so and congratulations! Yes, and congratulations with your birthday today. <laughs> yes. Thirty-seven years young. Thank yes. You for the fantastic presentation. I really Thanks. enjoyed it. Um, I just came on to invite you all uh, to the Dutch Viola Society stream, which is going to be next month's presentation, and we are going to be on June twentieth at the same time, at uh, half past eight uh, Central European time. And we have a pretty varied program for you coming up. Uh, so what we have done is we have a sextet performance with the board of the Dutch Viola Society of Leo Samama's sextet Viola Pomposa, which was composed for the International Viola Congress in Rotterdam in 2018. That was a lot of fun to put together. And we have an interview with Karen Dolman, who's sitting here about her hometown of Dordrecht and about how the Dutch Viola Society came into existence. And we have an, an interview discussion with Chaim Achterhube, the uh, viola luthier and maker who worked on the viola, which was made during the International Viola Congress in Rotterdam. And he's going to be in discussion with Judith. What's Judith's last name, actually? Judith Salman. She's from Canada as well, like you. There you go, <laughs> Judith Salman. And um, they're going to talk about the instrument that he built, and she's the one who's playing the instrument that was made during the Rotterdam Congress. 
Um, so how this instrument was built with this team of five different uh, luthiers working together in a very short time to put this instrument together during the course of the, of the Congress. And let me see. Oh, yeah. Most importantly, we have, of course, the Dutch Viola Society Viola Quiz, um, for which there will be uh, wonderful prizes. So everybody who is joining our stream uh, can uh, fill in and submit their answers to the multiple choice quiz. And uh, and the winner, of course, will get wonderful DVS prizes. And this quiz is very hard, so you really need to uh -huh. start studying now if you want to do yes. a good job. Yes, yes, yes. You have to know everything. We everything. did it in January on our New Year's reception, and I think nobody got more than 40% of the answers right. So you really need to start studying now. <laughs> so we hope to see you on June 20th. Okay. So let's see. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I would like to um, thank you all for watching this um, this uh, episode. And thank you, Roberto. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Luis. And thank you, Emlyn, being with us tonight. And I will go over. I have to go to, to a different device. It's a, it's a lot of things I have to think about. But I will go over to the next slide. So, goodbye, y'all. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, so, um, I'm here again. And I would like to, to tell you once more, at the 20th of June, same time like today. Um, and I will show you, before, we, before I will go, I will show you the trailer for the next one. So, see you all on the 20th of June. Hello, dear Viola friends. This is Holland calling, introducing the fourth live stream of the IVS, proudly presented to you by the Dutch Viola Society on Sunday the 20th at 8.30 p.m. European time, Amsterdam. The Dutch Viola Society was established in 2012 in the oldest town of Holland pearl of the turbulent delta and in the middle of three roaring rivers, the town of Dordrecht. Founding member Karen Dolman from Dordrecht will inform you in an interview about the establishment of the Dutch Viola Society and what was involved in the founding of a Viola Society. The current board of the Dutch Viola Society has prepared a quiz for our Viola friends all over the world. And be prepared to discover and accept inevitable gaps in your Viola-related intellectual development. Judith Salmon, Canadian violist studying at Codarts Rotterdam, will share sweet memories with you on the IVC 2018 Congress in Rotterdam and tell you about the birth of the Erasmus Viola. The Erasmus Viola was made during the Congress by four luthiers and Judith is the current player of this remarkable instrument. Especially for the IVS 2018 Congress, the distinguished Dutch composer Leo Samala created the Viola Sextet. The current board of the Dutch Viola Society recorded a sextet named Viola Pomposa, especially for you, listeners to the fourth live stream of the IVS, broadcasted from the oldest town of Holland this Sunday in June. <laughs>